Welcome to Triscoll Heart's Golden Compass podcast, a platform to share new emerging truths of today. I'm your host, Orla Quinn, and today I am very excited and very privileged to welcome a very special guest. Um, his name is Kevin Flanagan. And um, yeah, and he's an expert on Brehan Law. So a subject that I'm, that I'm so interested in um, discovering more about. So welcome, Kevin. Thank you so much for inviting me on, Arla. Great. Okay. Well, I'm going to introduce you and then we'll go into your wisdom and expertise. Okay. So for those of you who don't know Kevin, he founded the Brehan Law Academy in 2013, having attained his own bachelor's degree in law and society. So his mission was to revive an, an appreciation and respect for the old laws and customs of early Ireland and to represent them in the modern world in a practical and relatable manner. He has spoken at academic symposiums, festivals and conferences and runs a YouTube channel and has created three courses dedicated to different aspects of early Irish culture, law and mythology. So this is how I came across Kevin, it was you, Kevin, on YouTube when I was watching your YouTube channels, kind of on these subjects on early Irish culture, um, the mythology, kind of the chronology of the mythology, and also then just the, yeah, a little bit more then of the the, the depth of what the Brehan Law is. So maybe maybe actually just start there with you know like what for those listeners who are tuning in and wondering what what is the Brehan law maybe give them maybe give them just a very brief description or a brief um interpretation of of what the Brehan law is just maybe to start with Brehan laws yeah i'll try to keep it brief um I, first of all i i first learned about the Brehan law when i was very young i think but it was just something that i had heard about and i didn't really know what it was um maybe around 10 years ago now is when i started to really take an interest in it and uh, the thing that amazed me at the time is you know we're just kind of born into a society into a world and things are the way they are and then to realize that in ireland we had a completely different way of doing things and it just i just started to imagine you know what that society was like and i think maybe in the early days when i was learning about it there was a bit of romanticism attached to it as well but in a nutshell the brehan law is i would describe it as a justice system not so much a legal system. And I make a clear distinction between what we have today as a legal system rather than a justice system. And a couple of the key features that made this different is that is what we call a polycentric justice system, which meant that the people who were affected most had the biggest role in the system. The, it was very much a community-based type of law uh, that developed through custom. So a law became a law when over the course of many years, over the course of uh, even a century, the way things were done in society became a norm, that this is the way things are done here. And then eventually the norm lasted so long that it just became a law or a custom. Then we had some qualified people who we call Brehans, which is, comes from the, it's the English anglicization of the Irish word for a judge, which is a brehav, which we still use to this day. So it was called Brehan Law by the English, which is kind of a misnomer. It's not very accurate to think of it as Brehan Law. But these agents, the Brehans, played a very like pivotal role in society. Their, their job was not to, not to apply the laws of the king or the state, but rather to, to collect the knowledge and have an understanding and interpretation of the laws of the people that the people had created. Um, the other interesting thing with the judges is that they didn't have a right to hear cases like what we have today when you're brought before a court and there's a judge and that's his duty and it's his right. They had to be kind of hired or appointed by the parties to the suit. And interestingly, the defendant usually was the one who chose the Brehan. And the reason that Brehan was chosen over somebody else is that they had a reputation of fairness. They had a reputation of being able to interpret the laws, the customs, in a way that was concordant with the way that society already worked. Interesting thing about the laws is that most of them were not actually written down. We started to have manuscripts from the, the Christian era onwards, 
Um, but we know from the linguistic use of the, 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 the lingu language in the manuscripts and the tropes that this is a lot older, that the, 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 even though it was written down then, it was a lot older. But the laws were actually given in a form of poetry. The judgments were uttered like a poetry and the, the words of the Brehan were seen by the people to have some sort of like magical significance to them. Uh, as well. And of course, when we go further, further back into Irish history, there was no distinction between the Brehan, the Druid, and the Philly, the poet. There used to be one officer, one man or woman, and it should be said there were definitely women Druids and Brehans and everything, and poets, um, that this, this office was fulfilled by one person in the society. And then as time went on, they specialized and it, it differentiated into having a legal branch and a sort of religious ceremonial branch and a, and a poetry branch. So one of the big key things, well, a couple of key things, uh, restitution was the modus operandi of this system. It wasn't about retribution. It wasn't about um, punishment. It wasn't even so much about attributing blame and making people feel guilty for like ashamed of their actions. It was kind of more uh, practical in the sense that it understood that people make mistakes. You know, sometimes accidents happen and sometimes people do things that they regret. That wasn't the point of the law. The point of the law was if a wrong had been committed in society, it creates a disharmony in, within that community. The purpose was of the judge. He was kind of like a legal alchemist or a social alchemist, but he was, uh, you know, dealing with the different energies within the tribe and this, that this person had been wronged and to try and articulate a principle based in nature, something that could be recognized in nature and in the form of a poem that would restore the, the harmony to the community. And this usually came in the form of restitution. Last point I'll say, and I'll give, I'll just take a breath, <laughs> is um, reputation was really important in the system as well. So it wasn't um, like today in our system, it's very much geared around title. Your legal title is what really matters. But back then, it was your reputation that meant everything. Title was, was, was um, as a result of your reputation. So people who had a higher status in the society, who had a higher reputation, and that normally meant people who were wealthier, uh, who had like, you know, more opportunity, better education, and so on. They were held to a higher standard by the law because they were deemed to know better. Um, so these are a couple of interesting just a brief couple of interesting points about the Brehan law that would be very different from the system we have today. Mm, yeah, very good. Yeah. Okay. So there's a lot in that and I want to go back to some of the points that you raised. So that was so nice introduction and we'll flesh it out a bit more. Um, it's interesting, Kevin, that, you know, you're, you're, you know, you've established the Brehan law Academy, but it's almost like a part-time job for you because you do work in a, you have a, a main, another main job. Um, so maybe give us a little bit of, on your personal life, right? So, you know, how did you get into this? And also, how does your work <laughs> apply to this? Give us a, a, a kind of a more background on Kevin and who mm. Kevin is. Again, I'll try my best to, to keep it brief. But um, I was one of those kids who was kind of like... Um, always curious about the unknown and I was always like had my nose in a book and I was the one in the family that would go off like exploring by myself through the forest and stuff like that and so I always had this kind of curiosity about the nature of reality really um, <laughs> and as time went along and uh, you know when I was younger I went I did my how you say my walking about my uh, rite of passage to India when I was in my early 20s <clears throat> And began to learn a lot about Eastern philosophy and so on. And one of the ideas that really appealed to me was the idea of self-realization. And what was that? What was enlightenment? What did it mean to have self-knowledge? Uh, when I returned from India, um, uh, again, tried to keep it brief. I had a series of, <clears throat> let's say, realizations around um, the months when I returned and a lot of them centered around, I started to become interested in the law. And you might have heard of uh, the Freeman movement that was kind of kicking off in Ireland back then, 2008, 2000, 2008, yeah. 
So I started to get very interested in the idea of freedom and, and consciousness and how these, these ideas of like the, the will of an individual, me as an individual, how does that interplay with my consciousness and what's my relationship to the state and why, from where did my obligations to the state begin? And this kind of was, the, through doing this research, it eventually led me to Breton Law, which was just one branch on the tree, if you know what I mean. Um, my ambition with the Breton Law Academy and the activism, quote unquote, I don't like the word activism, but it's, easy, it's easier to say that, that I was doing back then was really to try and bring, to, to bring a message of freedom to people that, that, that um, kind of related to self-realization and, and consciousness. And, but in a practical way, like what, how do you live your life today? How free are we really? And then when I came across the Breton Law, I realized that, oh my God, there's actually historical examples of, of societies where um, justice happened and, you know, um, people were happy and they were free, probably a lot more free than, than we are even today in many ways. Um, but it didn't have a centralized power. It didn't have a centralized structure. It wasn't based on order and command. So the Breton Law was my first kind of... A, um, awakening to that sort of society but I need to say and I, I think your listeners would like to hear that it's not just unique to Ireland actually what I realized when I was studying law we do comparative law we looked at the Hindu legal system the pre-colonial system of India we looked at Sharia law we looked at um, tribal law aboriginal law and I kind of went on a tangent and studied a lot of Somalia law now um, not to <laughs> Not to say that like I am advocating like a society like like Somalia or something like that, but what was interesting to me was that there were a lot of parallels between these systems, a lot of parallels and similarities between systems that had no geographical connection to each other. The only thing they had in connection with each other was that this was pre-colonial. So to me, it suggested from a, like a social sciences point of view, anthropological point of view, that it seems like this is how human beings organize themselves in the absence of centralized command, centralized uh, uh, control. Just as a little addendum to that, I am not speaking about a utopian system here. I'm not saying it was perfect. I'm not talking about like the old Atlantis or something like that. There's a lot of issues, a lot of things that would not be compatible with today's society which we can go to if you want, but just to put that caveat there as well, that I'm not being utopian here. Um, but still, during my uh, process of getting a law degree, I was looking at the challenges that we were being asked to deal with in, in class, the issues, the legal issues, and trying to look at it from the perspective of a Breton. How would they have dealt with this in the past? How would they have dealt with prisons, which they didn't really have? Or how would they treat this type of an offense or this type of um you know s civil wrong in the past how would they have dealt with pollution you know things like this and um, so i was kind of always mixing together this idea of like my, my love for freedom and curiosity with a want for a better world um, and to come back to the job you asked me about so i work for an organization that uh, is an international organization and we, we work with students around the world uh, some very like conflict areas as well where it's quite dangerous for them to be doing this but we're promoting like personal freedom freedom of expression um, free speech these sorts of things we give students training in that so I'm very blessed I, I mean like, I, I'm living in Georgia now in Tbilisi I'm living on the other side of the world I've been to many many countries and I'm so blessed that I get to travel and I get to continue to you know promote those values that were important to me 10 years ago or more uh, to younger people and talk about freedom and talk about consciousness and self-responsibility and self-realization. But I sometimes do talk about Breton Law at these events as well to kind of give an example of historical, uh, a historical example of, of these principles in action. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um, it's interesting that you do that, you know, um, and I'm not surprised that you do. And I think they're very lucky to, that, that you do. Um, because I think it's something that we talked, we talked about this before about how um, knowing who you are and your, your ancestors' culture, your ancestors' customs, um, it does something for your soul, huh? It gives you a, sen a deeper sense of belonging, of knowing who you are. And it, sometime, it somehow satisfies a deep 
I think a deep yearning that a lot of people have in today's culture where they don't, who they, where, where they don't maybe know who they are because they don't know their custom. They don't know their, you know, they're not connected to their ancestors and they're not connected to ancient or that tribal wisdom that comes from knowing your lineage, <laughs> so to speak. So, you know, this, this brings it into kind of more of the shamanic realm, but, you know, I think this is an important point um, to raise um, because it's something that I certainly felt when I started to do some of your research. I felt this very, um, this, this, this very deep sense of coming home. Yeah, mm -hmm. of, of really coming home to root, to know who I am and uh, where I come from, you know, the customs coming home. Yeah, you wrote it down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I totally agree with that. And I think we mentioned when we spoke brief briefly before that I, uh, I'm half and half. I was born in England to so an English father and an Irish mother. And I grew up in Ireland my whole life. And I feel that maybe as a man, I can look back and analyze a little bit differently. That maybe part of my calling towards this was that search for identity, you know, uh, like my classmates, they all, as far as they could go back on either side of their family, great, great, great grandparents, all Irish. So they didn't need any sort of validation or something like that. Maybe, maybe that's what kind of attracted me to this. But just to say, I agree with you that there is this sort of, it sort of feels like nostalgia, but it's deeper than that. And it, it, there's a lot of aha moments and a sort of a feeling like you're reading something that you've read before or that you've dreamt about or something. There's something like misty in the back of the mind that, that uh, when you uncover it, it kind of excites the heart. I remember, and it's, it's like nice to talk to you about it, to remember those feelings of just this like very deep, passionate excitement to dive deeper and deeper. And the, the books are not easy to read, the old books. They're hard to read and it's hard to piece together. And that's why I think a lot of people, well, Irish people like their heritage and their history. It's, it's something that's important to us. And there's lots of reasons for that. Um, we love our Gaelic, our Irish music, our Gaelic football. Our language is making a huge revival right now, which is so amazing to see that happening naturally. Again, not through the, cent through the central command, but through the, the desire of people to reconnect um, with, with their heritage. But the Irish law, the Brehan law, is one aspect that people just don't know about and they overlook it. And I say, I've said this to friends of mine, it's like, imagine that you never knew hurling existed. And then all of a sudden we found out hurling existed thousands of years ago. Like the Breton law is even more significant than that because this explains to us the nature of our ancestors. What did they care about? What were their morals? How did they, how did they live with each other? And it gives us kind of a very fly on the wall look the most out of all the areas that we could study the mythology and the annals and so on. They're all great. And you get this tapestry that kind of weaves together. But the law is the missing thread that people just kind of overlook. And it's quite, it's quite sad that they do that, which was the reason for, I guess, the Brehan Law Academy to start having this conversation and getting people um, sort of more interested in it again. One little thing I do want to say, because um, there's, a, there's, you know, there's, there's issues around talking about these things now in Ireland, like talking about identity and Irishness and Gaelicness. It's being kind of like, you know, in the era of Trump, it, there's a kind of a sensitivity around it. And people, you know, some people have a, a bad reaction to that. They think that you're being exclusive of other people and they're not part of it. But the, the truth is actually, no, we're all part of it because when you go far enough back, we're all coming from these sorts of tribal systems uh, centered around family, family honor, respect, uh, responsibility, dignity, um, you know, uh, making amends with your neighbor, your, your, yeah, your honor and your word. We're all coming from that. I guess like the reason why we're so lucky in Ireland, well, lucky, <laughs> I sound weird to say that because we've lost so much. We're speaking English right now. We're uncovering these like ancient treasures from our past that we didn't even know were there lying in the bog. We weren't that lucky. But the one thing we do have uh, to, our, to our advantage is we love to write. Those ancient Irish, they love to write and they have law manuscripts on things like beekeeping. Like it's like they got just so bored one day, I'm going to write the laws about the bees, you know, and they, they put a lot of stuff to writing. This, of course, is where we got the name Insula Sunctorum, a doctorum, the island of saints and scholars. We were known for writing. So what, why we have an advantage over, say, um, Amazonian people who are trying to like... Uh, 
bring some like oil company or whatever logging company to court for invading their land, they don't have any written law to refer to. And I did hear a case, now I've never been able to find evidence of this, somebody else I know, uh, Andrew St. Ledger from the Woodland League, he was telling me that he came across a case where native uh, tribes in America, I think in the South, tried to use Breton law, referred to Breton law in the court case, and they said, like, this is, this is our law, we just didn't write it down, but this is the same as what we believe. And so, so I don't want this to sound like it's like, you know, Ireland for the Irish sort of thing. I'm not into that at all. Uh, and actually, this is a human thing. Yeah. Um, it's a human thing. Everybody can have a piece of this um, in their own culture. And like, we have enough to share. And the more people who are interested in it, uh, the better. But it, it's a human thing. And then in the Irish context and for Irish people, it is a sense of coming home, reconnecting, uh, remembering, and... Um, and it feels right. It feels right when you read it, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, definitely that was the sense I, I got. And, and maybe just kind of similar to your, the case of identity that you described. I'm from Northern Ireland originally. And so there was a lot of that confusion around the politics growing up in Northern Ireland, a divided community. Um, you know, there's, there's, it's a very messy, very gray kind of area of identity. It's, it's not a very, you know, it, it would be different from kind of people's identity, maybe growing up in the South. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I suppose, yeah, that coming home piece for me, the Brahan laws was so important. And I think, you know, going back to this case of self-responsibility, um, Kevin, cause this is really, I feel like this is, this is the really important kind of aspect to it right like the self import the self responsibility piece because I think that's what got me so excited when I found out about Brahan Law and about people's agency you know like how people you know that it was so decentralized people that the people had participated in it as you say it was restorative it wasn't you know it wasn't about like it wasn't a centralized system with a power over it was a very much uh, participative process and it was very much not only you know not only conducted but also designed by community by people mm. by people so you know let's go to today and how can these laws still be relevant because like you describe in your NGO work it is still relevant it's it's relevant I see in in society where you know I'm living in rural East Clare Okay, we're we're not so important to centralize Dublin here. So there's a lot of there's a lot of local organization, local initiatives. You know, like um, you know, like this is where I can see really Brehan Law, some of Brehan Laws, how they can thrive in places of rur like rural Ireland. You know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's a great that's a great segue. So so first of all, what I like to do is just give like maybe three what I think are very practical examples. We've, we've kind of brushed against them, but just to kind of put it in, in stone here, uh, of how our principles from the law that could be very relevant today. The first one that we talked about was having a uh, focus on restitution over retribution. Mm -hmm. um, second one is reputation and status, that those of a higher status should be held to a higher uh, degree of culpability, if, especially if they abuse that position. And then the third one, which is one of my favorites, because I think it's quite practical, it's based in economics. I also have a master's in politics, philosophy and economics, is, is this idea of judicial market opening. One of the issues, I think actually one of the biggest issues in today's society is the power of the judges and the courts. And it's one issue that we don't really talk about. We focus mostly on the political decisions. Fine. Um, I mean, that's what's in the news. But really, like what's happening in the district courts? Why are people from... The, the poor part of the city getting like two or three years in jail for the same crime as the, the rich kid who just gets a slap on the wrist and he gets a fine because he plays rugby or you know how you know what I mean so so the 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 um what's the word uh the judges can't be fired and they point they have political bias involved there they have maybe even like social biases as well and there's not much that we can do to kind of regulate that unless we open the market of judges like what they had in Breton law where in the same way that you can like go and hire the solicitor that you want 
uh, sh- it would be great if you could go and hire the judge that you wanted. And you would hire a judge based on their reputation. So it ties into the previous point that reputation was, was really, really important. Um, now, I get this asked this question quite a lot, or if I'm talking to Irish people, in particular Irish people about this, they'll say something like, uh, you know, that's all well and good, but that, the government is never going to bring this back. You know, they're never going to do this. And my rebuttal to that is like, well, it shouldn't be brought in by the government because it was never done by the government in the first place. It was based, uh, it was by the will of the people. Now, we can go a little bit deeper into that and say that the, the, the social system, the social hierarchy that was there helped to facilitate that, that will of the people. Um, but the idea that the government should come out and say, oh, now we're going to bring back Brehan Law, it's just not, it's not that's not Brehan Law, it's not the same. So I say to people, well, what can we do about it? Why are you even talking about this? Why does it matter? Well, how we do it is in how we interact with each other. That's the self-responsibility. Something I say to the students I work with quite often, because I really want them to get this and to realize how much power that they have to be alive now, today. There's a generational responsibility as well. I'm not talking about what our grandparents did. I'm talking about if you're alive today, now, you have responsibility to help determine what world we live in. You have responsibility to shape the world a little bit in your little patch, whether it's in your house, whether it's starting with you as an individual, then it moves to your smaller circle, your household, then your next circle, maybe your close friends, and then your community, and then so on and so forth. It is our responsibility if we're alive today to, to realize, first of all, that we do play an influential role in the world that's around us, the world of the five senses that we can see here in touch, you know? And uh, to throw back to Gandhi, you know, be the change you want to see in the world. It's not go out and fix the big, big, bad problems that you see in the news every day. It's fix yourself, fix your family, fix your community. And if in a hypothetical sort of utopian situation, everybody was doing that, everybody was able to talk to their neighbor, they have a dispute, go and talk about it, sit down, you know, call in a third party if they need to like help regulate it, try to have a heart, uh, try to have that feeling in your heart that I want reconciliation. I don't want to get my own back. I don't want to, like, how dare they do that to me? I'm going to make them pay for that. This is, this is venomous. It's vengeance. And that becomes what we are. Uh, the majority of people are doing that. So it comes down to self-responsibility in that sense, which, which to me it ties back to what we mentioned previously, self-realization, knowing who you are as an individual, realizing that you have power you have personality you have ownership of yourself and you have uh, the ability to make others lives better or worse and the ability to make your community better or worse it totally lies with you but what we do now is so convenient because we've outsourced everything to the state out- outsourced law education whatever that it's easy to blame the government when things aren't going right it's easy to say well they did this wrong or they did that you know and it's quite convenient for us to have that kind of a scapegoat but at the end of the day, they're only, they're only, like, their mandate comes from our will, our acquiescence, our consent, whatever you want to look at it. So to, to kind of put politics on the shelf for a second and focus on community, which is the poly, that's real politics. Poly, the politics coming from the word poly meaning people. It's the people around you. Um, and is, let's say this, uh, there is a dispute. How are you going to handle that next time? Are you going to call the police or call, like, mom and dad? You know, the, the state to come in and like help teacher. us to correct our behavior, the teacher, exactly, because we're not competent enough to correct our behavior ourselves. We're not adults. We need a, t- a teacher to come in, our, the authority figure who knows best, who at the end of the day is just another flawed human being like the rest of us. Or are we going to try and like make amends ourselves? So, in, in practical terms, because I know we're getting a little bit like, um, spiritual here which is fine Uh, but in practical terms like one thing that people could start thinking about is um you know we don't only have the courts as a way to settle disputes in ireland we also have uh, mediation and uh, the other forms of dispute resolution and this is what the Breton law was actually it was mediation or arbitration they're very similar things except arbitration just has a stronger outcome and and a lot of businesses are using arbitration in their contracts and so on. It's not, it's not like it, it happens. But instead of like going to avail of court services 
to punish our neighbor. Let's look at finding living Brehens today who okay, might not be influenced entirely by the Brehen law, but people who are there to find harmonious outcomes. One idea I had back years ago when I was first getting into all of this is what I would love to do if I had, if I got the income I wanted from it, like if I was able to actually afford to do this, to qualify myself as an arbitrator and then be, uh, provide services to people as I will arbitrate your case on the principles of Breton law and these are the things that we will agree and this is the way it will go ahead. And that's a service that I could provide for people. And in the long run, I, I would like the Breton law to be a, a, like a, a not-for-profit uh, organization. I just don't have, to be honest, the time or the resources to do it. But, but I would love to also provide scholarships if I had the money to other people who wanted to come into that idea. And you could have, like how the common law began in England, you had traveling judges who were based around different parts of the country and moved from town to town to hear cases. But like that would be an amazing solution. That's self, that's self driven. That, that doesn't require permission. It doesn't require like sanction from the state or even like a grant from the state. I don't want, I wouldn't be, that that's not the way to go with any of this, but you could imagine, imagine just having like 10 or 20 people who were like Brehen law dispute resolution services, um, and you're providing yeah. that to the community. It would be amazing, you know. And it's not impossible. That's a that's a practical solution. Yeah, I love it. I love it, and I like I totally advocate for it. I'm behind you, Kevin. Like I think that's the way to go. And yeah, like I'd I'd love to if you were doing that. I would sign up. Apprentice, apprentice here, right here. Um, <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, maybe we'll revisit that. Um, yeah, because it is, it's such a, I mean, because more and more people, I suppose, are looking to, they're looking to ancient ways and ancient knowledge as a way to, uh, you know, to apply, apply to current situations, to current practices, just like, you know, the people like, look at marriage, for example, you know, people are choosing not to go through the mainstream, the church, they're looking to the old practices, actually, of hand fasting, and these kind of practices and looking for spiritual um, uh, priests or priestesses who can 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 you know can can do the ceremony. So we are looking. There is active. There there is an appetite. There is a demand for this, right? There is definitely a demand for it. And I think it's just as you said before, people just don't know about the law piece, right? We know about we know about different aspects of our culture. Um, and we're quite passionate about these these particular aspects of our culture, but there's not enough of us who know about the Brehen laws, like the legal system. And I think that's for me, maybe because I come from a political background myself. So I'm very like this this ignited my fire, just like maybe it, like like it did yours. But I think for so many of us, it's going to you know the more people that find out about it, the more people that know about it are actually you know would be very interested in in learning it to know how to adapt it to current life you know mm -hmm. yeah i agree um, and just kind of to flesh that out a little bit um it's a law of the heart hmm. the law. so that's something that needs to be felt and it means that people kind of need to, to choose to buy into that and opt into that like i'm going to have a law of the heart what I mean by that is like, if somebody did wrong to you, like, let's say I did something to betray you, you would feel that your heart sinks. You feel that betrayal or, um, there's a couple of examples from the mythology as well, where you can see the, 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 the wrong judgment is given by somebody. And when the right judgment is spoken, I've done this in audiences. You can see, you can feel a change in the audience when you, say this is the this is the more just outcome they kind of went yeah because they feel it it's, it's a law of the heart and so the, the law that we have today the legal system which is a remnant of like very hard time in our history let's face it um uh, what we just take for granted that this, this is normal and this is the way it always is and this is the only way that, that that it has to be but that's a law on people that's a law on us it's placed upon us by external forces that are beyond our control or reach. The Breton law was a law for us. It was a law yeah. for the people. And that's a huge difference. Um, so I imagine to come back to this the arbitration example, like I would love 
I couldn't imagine it would actually happen, but just to play with the idea that one day a judge of the state system comes into court and he sits down on his bench to hear all the complaints that people have and there's nobody there. Nobody is there. We take our business elsewhere. We, take, we do it ourselves. And to me, that would be the sign of a truly mature society that no longer needs to avail of this state mechanism because we have a voice, we have a heart, we have hands. We can reach them out and we can shake hands with each other. It just means, and people don't like hearing this, means we need to start talking to each other more. It means we stop seeing each other as strangers when we're sitting on the bus. It's amazing, like, is, uh, you know, the human mind is an amazing mystery and we're surrounded by them. And like, we prefer to look on our phone or put our earphones in and it is so much like potential and love and all of this great, great connections you can have with people just sitting around us. And I think that's what we've lost which they didn't lose in the past because that's what they, they needed that in the past in order to survive. It was really essential that they stuck together and they looked after each other or at least like looked out for each other, you know? Mm. Oh, I think this is really key, Kevin. I think you've kind of given us the golden nugget kind of at the end. Thank you so much for this. Um, cause we're going to wrap it up now. And, um, yeah, so I just want, I want you to let people know how to contact you and how to follow up with your courses and all of that kind of yeah. jazz. Okay, so um, the website is brehanlawacademy.ie. That has a blog there. You'll find some videos and um, you'll be able to find information about the courses there as well. Most active on Facebook, Brehan Law Academy. Um, you search that and you'll find me on YouTube as well. And um, for what, I, what I'm going to do, I think I mentioned this to you last time, for any of your listeners who want to take the Brehan Law course, they can use the, uh, the coupon code HEART, H-E-A-R-T with capitals, and they'll get 50% off. So if they do want to dive deeper into it, that's fine. Uh, if anybody wants to just like reach out to me and ask a question or whatever, you can contact me, um, brehanlawacademy at gmail.com. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Kevin. And thanks for that. Um, thanks for that gift, the, the code, the discount. Um, it'll be on the email that I send out to, you know, the list. So, yeah, so definitely I like having listened to these, to, to these videos, they're so informational. I mean, you're so giving with your knowledge and you have been in this interview. So, so gracious. Thank you so much. I've thoroughly enjoyed it and I'm sure the listeners will too. So, uh, much, much appreciation. No, I, I'm really grateful you asked me on and it's not very often that I get to talk about these topics in a way that allows me to bring in the other kind of deeper stuff, the, the spiritual stuff. So it's been really enjoyable for me as well. So um, thanks again for, for having me on. Okay. Thanks, Kevin.